Um, my name is uh, Gerardo Narvaja. Um, I'm a director of technical services at Tokutech. I've been um, uh, joined my SQL back in 2001, stayed at the company through the Sun acquisition in uh, 2008, then left. Uh, since then, I've been working uh, my SQL DBA jobs, and then uh, a year and a half ago, approximately, I joined uh, Tokutech also doing sales support as I was doing while I was at my SQL. I also co-host the RSQL podcast. It's the community podcast for MySQL. It is available on iTunes, and if you go to www.rsql.com, you can subscribe to the podcast as well. Um, what I'm going to talk today is a little bit about the technology uh, behind TokoDB and why it makes sense uh, for the right use cases. And um, I'm towards the end, I'm going to explain a little bit how to get started, some of the common pitfalls, and it will be very brief and it'll get started, but it's just to put the facts in your, in your mind and from then on you can work with it and make sure you don't hit the pitfalls that many people actually hit when they start evaluating our software. So first of all, what is Tokotech? Um, Tokotech is a company that was founded by three uh, PhD um, that work in academia. Uh, one is a researcher at the MIT, the other one works at uh, Rutgers, and the third one at uh, State University of New York. On one conversation, uh, um, talking about IT issues and things behind uh, databases, one of them was actually an ex-Google uh, employee. Um, they were talking about the volume of data and how current technologies that were uh, invented in the 60s and 70s um, we're not going to be able to keep up with the volume of data um, that it's being generated on these days. Um, what they concentrated on uh, was first of all create a product that was viable and MySQL architectures having the plugin architecture for the storage engines uh, offered actually a very nice platform to implement their ideas and so they did creating TokuDB. As of late, uh, a few months ago, we also launched a MongoDB version with a fractal tree index technology underneath it called TokuMX. One of the things, and we're going to see how that we can achieve with these technologies, is very high compression rates, uh, which gives new life to the hardware that you have in use these days. Very high insertion rates as well which also gives life to software or hardware that you thought that it wasn't going to be able to keep up anymore with the amount of data that you manage these days. Basically, you can do that. And most importantly, this doesn't mean that you have to change your applications radically. You can use the knowledge you have today, the experience you might have today and your staff um, to work with our products as well. So basically, what is a fractal tree? And the five second question, or the one minute question, which is what it's going to take me to go through the slide, is inherently it's not that different from B trees, which is what indexing technology uses in most cases. So today, you're going to find them on databases and uh, file systems are the places where you find them the most. But it uses a much bigger uh, page size to begin with. So by using four megabyte page sizes, we can achieve the compression rates that uh, will show on the benchmarks. Compression dynamic algorithms, which are the most popular these days, basically take a sample of the data and they keep compressing based on the data that was already compressed. So with the, the traditional, for example, EnoDB page sizes, which uh, are 8K or 16K, there's only so much data you can go through. Uh, so there's only so much compression you can do. Uh, on the other hand, if you have four megabytes to, to compress, basically the algorithms uh, become really, really efficient. The other difference between the B trees and uh, fractal trees are the message buffers. And these message buffers are buffers that don't live uh, exactly in memory, and we're going to see them in a, little, in a little while, how they work are also transactional. And what does allow, that, that allows us to do is actually to group the I.O. operations and instead of having to do single operations for every transaction or every row or every index that is changed, 
it allows us to group all these transactions into bigger operations, making better use of uh, the hardware and um, allowing the hardware to actually handle a lot more data for the same amount of IOs. So this is how the bee tree works. Um, I'm going to go fast because it's a, it's a pseudo animation, um, so it works with PDFs as well. So this is uh, basically how a bee tree uh, works like. Does, by the way, does anyone know what the B stands for? There's several theories nobody knows for sure, but the prevalent theory is actually Boeing. <laughs> because it was created at Boeing, and uh, although Bayern distribution, actually some people say that that's the second theory uh, in Wikipedia. But yeah, the people at Boeing created it, so they said, how do we call it? i eh, call it a B-tree. Um, the strange things about trees in computer science is they grow upward and upside down, so the root nodes are the one at the top, and the leaf nodes are the one at the bottom. Uh, my daughter just graduated from the School of Forestry, so that drives her crazy, uh, that our trees are upside down. And the ones, the nodes in the middle are called pivots. Um, so as I insert a new value, what happens is it follows the rule. In this case, the rule was uh, greater or equal than. And if I insert a 15, it basically navigates applying the comparison function until it finds the leaf node. And that is the node or the page on the file that it's going to pick up. First of all, it has to read all the other, those nodes when the cache is called from the disk. And then it applies the transaction, and that is the transaction that gets, that is the page that gets, gets committed to disk. So imagine that we have a very limited machine, and these are the pages that are sitting in memory, or usually, as we call them, uh, being cached. So now we have to run a select or a concurrent select uh, operation on this. And the select is looking for number 25. And what happens is it is on another branch, so it has to go to the right first and then to the left instead of the other way around where the 15 was sitting. What this means is that this particular page was not in memory, wasn't cached anymore, so it has to go from disk. And again, for every single value, um, and remember these are 16K or 8K pages, for every single value it has to do the same si sort of operations. While the data, the working data set, and by working data set, I mean the, the data that you use the most frequently in your server, fits in memory, it is between the 80% or 90% of that data fits in memory, performance is going to be just fine. The problem is when you have a 64 gig RAM server and your data set is one terabyte. At that point, there's no way unless you only are checking the last yeah, updated data that it's going to fit in memory, which means that InnoDB or any database for that matter is going to have to go to disk constantly to be able to fetch the data to satisfy the queries. And that depends on the type of loads you have. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in um, the upcoming slides. Here's a similar diagram, in this case representing the fractal tree. The big squares are the four megabyte squares, and the little round dots are the what we call the basement nodes. And um, the reason to have basement nodes separate uh, or as well as the four megabyte uh, pages is that sometimes you have to do a point query. Basically, a point query is a query where you are, have a where clause or an end clause that specifies a number of primary keys, and basically you go and grab those by primary key from disk. If you have to evict or swap out uh, four megabytes of data, you're swapping out too much data and your cache becomes very inefficient. To overcome that, besides having the four megabytes pages, we also deal with the basement nodes separately. That way um, we can do those point queries effectively and cache them properly. Each node has the message buffers and those are the vertical uh, containers represented in the chart. So what happens when I add data? Data is treated as messages. All the operations are treated as messages. So first of all, the first insert is going to try to look whether it fits on the root node, on one of the nodes contained within the root page. 
And if not, it's going to land in the message buffer. So it doesn't go all the way down to the leaf node to store the data. So transactions don't need to do the additional reads from disk to retrieve the pages needed to locate all the way down to the leaf node. And as new data keeps coming in, basically it keeps filling in the proper slots. So you can see the data actually coming in through the root node, going through the comparison function on the tree, and filling out the buffer. Once the buffer is filled, there is one big flush that shifts all that data to the next node on the tree, which could be a leaf node or a pivot node, and distributes all, the, all that information, it distributes it on that particular page. So yes, we have one more flush that normally a B tree would have, but on the other hand, each flush and each operation is handling a lot of operations for the nodes that are underneath it. So that effectively reduces the number of I.O. operations on disk as compared to the B tree, and which improves performance greatly. So what about the reads then? So we have a bunch of data sitting on, on the different levels on the message buffers, and the queries actually follow the same path. So if you remember, on the example I gave for the B tree, number 25 required to retrieve a page from disk, um, although 15 uh, was inserted. What we can assume is, in the case of the, of the fractal tree, is that 15 would have been on the top node, so there's no need to uh, evict any other node from the cache, so 25 would have been cached. And since it follows the same path, if I'm looking then for 15, which could have caused an eviction of 25, the page containing 25, in this case, 15 will be sitting on the root node, so chances are you're going to retrieve it straight from the root node since it was just written and not have to evict any pages in the middle. And that is basically how we explain the high insertion rates. So every query would retrieve, you know, it would go through the tree, find if the data is sitting on the message buffer. If not, it just follows the same path as a regular B tree would do. So messages actually handle insert, update, and deletes. And we have a special set of messages that are schema changes. And schema changes, for example, adding a new column, expanding a column, adding a new index, are broadcast messages. And they're treated exactly like the uh, insert and updates and deletes with a difference that are broadcast to every single message buffer. Um, now we have the red dot, which is a schema changing message sitting in the buffer on the right place. So what happens if now if I do an insert? If I do an insert, the system is going to go through the same route and it's going to see that that column already exists. So it's going to be able to insert the, the changes uh, where they belong and it's going to know that the schema has changed. Now, since once we broadcast the message, there's no need to keep any lock on the table. Um, these changes are going to propagate in the same way. So as the different message buffers are flushed, the pages underneath it are going to contain those changes. Once the changes have been propagated to the leaf nodes, if it is a new index, that index, the, there's a switch that turns on and that index becomes available uh, for the optimizer. And because it, it broadcasts the message, as soon as that message is written to the database, control returns to the application. So you can do a hot uh, operation like adding a column, expanding a column, without having absolutely any downtime, not one millisecond. It just keeps going. So uh, as new queries come in, and since they see the changes, they know when actually those columns are available for incoming queries. So how does this translate into reality? Um, this, all the benchmarks that I'm going to talk about today are, uh, are available for you to reproduce on your own environment on our website. So if you go to our site and click into resources, there is a sublink to benchmarks and all the links are there and you can retrieve them from there. 
So, for example, this is a high uh, performance insert, and we can see the, red, the green line is actually InnoDB, and where it crosses around the 25,000 rows per second and drops, that is when, uh, for every insert, it has to actually start going to disk to find the leaf nodes on where to insert the next set of rows. And that's what we call the performance uh, cliff. And after that, performance degrades significantly until it's the bottleneck, uh, I.O. becomes the bottleneck, and it stays in that line at the bottom uh, as you go uh, towards the right of the chart. In the case of TokuDB, for in-memory load, performance is not that great. Uh, we have been improving that over, over time, and uh, we'll go through some of those improvements uh, pretty soon. Uh, but once actually it has to go to disk, things actually are not that bad, and it stays at a much higher performance than InnoDB and uh, usually B-trees. The same charts can be drawn for uh, our uh, TukuMX, which is the MongoDB version, and uh, almost any other um, B-tree-based architecture. So if we run on SSDs, um, you know, which is a common strategy to uh, be able to extend the right capabilities of uh, B-tree implementations, we still are faster, maybe not as dramatic as the previous chart, but we still are faster. One of the things you're going to notice is that the I.O. cliff is um, further to the right in the case of B-tree architectures, and, um, and it's not as dramatic in performance gains, but we still got a lot to do. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is, and we're going to see this in the upcoming slides, is that because we do less I.O. operations and we group them, it also extends the life of the SSD and uh, prevents early wear and tear. And anyone using SSDs with databases know that they burn at a very fast rate. So the next slide shows the uh, improved data loader. What we do in this case is when you're uh, filling up a database or restoring from a backup, if your backup is taken on CSV files, and you can do that with using MySQL dump dash dash tab option, our loader actually will digest the information from the CSV file uh, and create the fractal tree directly. So it doesn't go through the parser or any of the MySQL server in internal code. It goes straight into creating um, the tree, and that's where we get um, you know, great insertion rates. Um, many use cases that are highlighted on our, on our website actually use this feature. And the reason is, um, for example, genetic data or bioengineering data, they have to digest information that comes from hospitals or from the field. So they insert all that data, which is usually pretty big in terms of number of rows. Imagine how many rows can you have on a database representing the human genome. And for every new individual that has some sickness and have these genome samples, they have to insert it. This, uh, this loader actually inserts really fast, and it, the process takes a couple of hours where they should they used to take multiple hours, if not half a day, to uh, digest the same data. Um, the reason the local uh, keyword is uh, there crossed uh, is crossed is because many people think that um, load load data in file and load data local in file work the same, and they don't. Um, Load data in file needs this, the actual CSV file to be accessible by the server process on a local mount point. And the load data local in file actually transmits the data through, um, through the connection and it creates a temporary file on the server. In that case, it will revert back to a regular uh, load uh, data in file like the regular MySQL one that process one row at a time or chunks of rows at a time, but it doesn't create the index directly. It has to go through all the overhead of the server. So what are some of the strategies then that people apply to, to MySQL to get the, the working data set to fit in memory? The first one is partitioning. And for example, if you're ingesting a time series, 
partitioning by day or a couple of days or a week uh, is very common. And what you, what you end up having is each partition internally in MySQL is treated as its own table. And that table fits in memory. So for the insertion rate, you get um, very reasonable performance, very high performance. And if you're doing queries to query that data in the time series, it's common to have, uh, let's see what's going on on the last hour, last two hours, last six hours. Everything is coming from memory from the cache. And it's very efficient. The problem with that is that it adds complexity. Um, data volumes keep increasing every day. Uh, you saw the numbers on the number of devices and the number of internet users um, on the keynote today. And we're talking about billions and billions of devices that are out there and are constantly pinging information back to telco companies, e-commerce, social networks, you name it. And there's plenty of information and every day that information multiplies as new applications come up. Um, so basically it adds a lot of complexity because that data has to be kept for years at a time. Um, if your day, working data set matches the criteria for the partitioning, it works just fine. As I said, is having summaries of the last day, last hour, um, four time series works just fine. However, if you have to do a cross-section query, for example, for a given device, you know, how many times it pinged or it did a certain activity, things get a little bit more complicated because now a full table scan or even a multi-partition scan um, takes more time than it would normally do if it were a single table. Um, with TokoDB, since uh, the I.O. Um, bottleneck is shifted on a time scale to the right, it can handle much bigger data, data that doesn't fit in memory, then you have to deal with f fewer partitions. And fewer partitions and compression means that you have more data available in memory or more more data that you can process before you have to do administration tasks on partitioning. So it simplifies the overall administration. Even um, we have a blog, an old blog article which um, kind of tries to make the point that you don't really need partitions in MySQL if you're using TokoDB. However, we found that many of our customers and community members have shown us that for bulk deletes and purges, if you drop a partition, it's still much more efficient and easy and fast than uh, bulk delete operations. Another common technique that people use is using covering indexes. And covering indexes uh, apply when you're having to do range queries or uh, group queries where you have the secondary key but uh, every secondary key still has to look uh, using the primary key for the additional columns that are not included in the key. So EnoDB and uh, most B-Tree implementations, the optimizer knows that if the columns that are needed for a query are inside the key, that it doesn't have to go and do that primary key lookup. The problem with this is that uh, all of a sudden your table has a proliferation of secondary keys to satisfy certain queries that you need to be performant. So you might have a query that has date, customer, and then it has a bunch of other columns. Many secondary keys that very look alike and the columns on the tail of that index tend to be slightly different. That creates a problem and one of the problems is for every key secondary key you add, your performance suffers. It's another B tree that has to go through the motions to be kept updated and, um, and maintained by the system. Now on TokoDB, we allowed actually um, secondary keys to be clustered. What this means is alongside with a uh, secondary key, we store all the columns. So some of these queries now, instead of having to rely on many secondary keys, you have the secondary key with all the columns in there and it satisfies a number of queries that you may not have the secondary key for. And you get an overall performance. Uh, the drawback with this is that you have a second copy of your data set. Now, having a second copy of your data set is not that bad since we're going to see that compression numbers are 10 times or 20 times better than regular data. So if you get 20 times compressed and then you multiply by 2, you still have a 10x compression ratio and you have better performance for these range queries 
and since you're maintaining a lesser number of keys, um, you don't have that penalty into the writes. So here are the benchmarks for the compression ratios, and we can see in green the InnoDB numbers, and in blue the numbers for TokoDB. By default, we use the Quickle Z algorithm for compression, which is the lesser compression, but it's um, lighter on the CPU resources. So that depends on the kind of machine you have. If you have um, a typical AWS instance where processing power is sort of expensive, then Quickle Z will give you good enough compression. 10x is not um, unheard of, and it will be enough. In the case of LZMA, which is the most aggressive compression, the numbers are on the right. Um, it will take a, a bunch of CPU power. So if you have 16 cores or more, or 8 cores or more actually, is what we recommend as the threshold, you'll see that you can, you can get the more aggressive compression without a degradation or a significant degradation in performance. And um, besides our benchmark, I'm going to quote from Shlomi Noach. He wrote a blog uh, not long ago, actually in the last few weeks, uh, part one and part two, part three is coming, uh, about what his experiments look like. And in his case, with SSDs, uh, performance is better than InnoDB, but overall what motivates him is the compression. He can get 20 to 1 compression ratio on his data, which is real-world data for his data warehouse and his company. 10 to 1 compression compared to, uh, to InnoDB with 8K block size. And if you're using a Fusion IO card, one of those multi-terabyte <laughs> ones, and your data was pro um, pretty much filling out the space and growth rate um, was promising you to basically max out that card in, by the end of the year, when you're looking at 10x compression basically, it tells you that you can use it for as long as you want and you still be able to make the most out of that expensive hardware. Another technique then, which is what this slide um, talks to, is insertions on the master happening at a very high rate and you can get a pretty good performance even with all the improvements. But even in 5.6 single schema, when you talk about big data, usually you don't have multi-tenancy or multi-schema servers, you have a single schema on the server, um, the slaves can't keep up or they have problems keeping up. Since we can handle a, a higher insertion rate to begin with, slaves tend to have a much slower delay. Uh, what people usually overlook are the F-sync settings and they leave aggressive F-syncing um, when they use TokoDB by default, which is what we think it, it's better safe than sorry. But you can relax them in the same way that you can relax TRX commit on InnoDB. Um, and we'll cover that in a moment. Uh, but once you match the settings that you would have for InnoDB uh, to the, uh, with TokoDB, the insertion rates are way faster. Besides that, we added some uh, insert absurd optimizations. So if you have an insert um, duplicate key update, and you're incrementing a counter uh, when that happens, or you're setting a single um, single column value to a constant, or things like that. We take shortcuts. Insert uh, insert on duplicate key updates require an additional read from the database to verify the, dupli the data duplication, and also to be able to update and put that data back into um, the row. We take some shortcuts um, based on internal algorithms in uh, too long to explain right here, but basically what that means is when you're running on a slave, that slave doesn't have to do the additional reads and inserts match faster, basic, keeping up with what the master is doing. What we added is a keyword, no R, and uh, what it means is no other affected rows. And that's what the abbreviation is. So if you do that in the master, and it's one of the supported insert or absurd operations, then the server, the operation is going to complete. Uh, condition for this to work is it has to be statement-based replication, at least for the session. Um, so that statement has to replicate uh, as, uh, as a statement known as a row image. 
in many cases, it really addresses uh, slave delays for high insertion rates. So this is another spin on the SSDs. Um, in this benchmark, what we did is we throttled uh, the number of inserts that we were doing and then measured the number of I.O. operations that happened using InnoDB and TokoDB. As you can see, TokoDB is really small on the left-hand side, really, uh, really down there. And again, this is a huge multiplier in the lifetime or useful life of an SSD and it, since it wears out a lot slower. Um, I have friends that work um, at some of the social networks and they replace at least one or two SSDs every single, every single week and they have to constantly be switching in, uh, in and out servers uh, just to replace the arrays with the SSDs because of this. So imagine if instead of that they would be doing it every two weeks. It's huge savings both in manpower and uh, hardware infrastructure. Um, another thing you have to do uh, when you have a uh, high, write, um, high um, write load on SSDs is you have to reserve a part of the SSD for the flash translation layer. As opposed to rotating disks, SSDs don't write the same information in place on the same sector where the information was living up to that moment. What it does is there is a flash translation layer that says, okay, this block is out, out of date, puts it in a queue, and then writes the new information on, on a new block. And that takes some time. And in high write situations, on high traffic situations, that means that that queue can grow a little bit big. And so you have to reserve some space. Um, they recommend 80%, 75% are usual recommendations from manufacturers. And um, for, so the transla translation layer can have enough space to work. If you have uh, higher write rates, uh, lower write rates, and lower overall I.O. on the disk, then you can reduce that space, giving you, for the same hardware, giving you a bigger area to write on or to be useful uh, for usual application load. We have some blog articles on our website that explain um, some of the mathematics behind this. So this is the slide I was promising before. Um, it reduces I.O. operations by a factor of 10x. Uh, on, on top of that, you get the compression. So this is Shlomi's actual quote. And he had some um, problems that he had to go, by, um, to go around it and we learned a lot from him. Some of them we had to improve our documentation. Some of those facts I included into this presentation that I got from him. But one of the things that motivated him to keep going was this quote. Is, so he had a two terabyte of InnoDB compressed data running on a flash drive that had three or four terabytes, I can't remember. Growth rate projections, basically in a few months they were gonna be out of space. Um, giving uh, the increase in business for that company and new projects that were coming on and feeding into that database. So he would have to start thinking into sharding. Sharding means not only the fact that you have to have additional hardware, but changes in the application to be able to deal with that sharding. All of a sudden he gets, even if he gets the same performance, even if he has to do a few workarounds on his configuration, he gets for the same data, 200 gigabytes. All of a sudden, all those additional terabytes are there for him to keep growing and um, be able to uh, still handle with that. I'm waiting for his third part where he's going to comment on actual um, on actual uh, performance numbers. One of the other things that was interesting in his blog, and um, that I forgot to mention, is I said that outer table are broadcast messages and those go into the message buffers. Those message buffers are also transactional. So everything that gets written into that goes to disk and is committed. So if your server crashes in the middle of an outer table, you bring up the server again, does whatever crash recovery needs to be doing, and wherever the outer table was at that point, it recovers from there. Try to get one of these two terabyte tables actually to run an outer table in InnoDB no matter how hot it is and crash in the middle. What you end up sometimes is with a dead server. 
So here are the hot schema changes. I covered this when I was covering uh, the charts of the um, fractal tree. Um, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. The hot column expansions that we support, we don't support all data types, just these data types. We're going to keep adding new ones as time goes by. And this is when many people say, okay, on SSDs, hot data, hot column additions or hot index creation is really hot, you know, minimum downtime. Even on my SQL 5.6, what they did is all the time while the temporary table is being created with a new schema, they don't lock the original table as MySQL 5.5 and previous versions used to do. So it is hotter, but at the time when it has to switch between the new table and, uh, and the old table, it still has some downtime, whether it is a few minutes, um, you know, normally it's a few seconds, but with big tables, uh, terabytes of data that usually takes a few minutes, it's still some downtime. And we measured this by doing an outer table on SSD on MySQL 5.5 and, um, and with TokoDB. And basically those, that little seconds gap or minutes gap is what you're going to see up to MySQL 5.6. I'm waiting to see what they have done on MySQL 5.7. Um, but TokoDB has nothing, basically because it broadcasts the message, comes back, and that's it. End of story. So this is the things to remember so you don't you get the right expectations. These are the three sweet spots and some other reasons that people have been uh, telling us why they're choosing TokoDB and succeeding in implementing TokoDB. Either you have you need the performance with high volumes of data without changing hardware, without changing your application, and we have plenty of use cases on our website about that. Um, you need agility, add, drop a column. You have uh, not only big data, but you have constantly because of uh, changing requirements in the business, you need to add a new column, you need to add a new index, and you're 24 7 up, uh, up time. And you can say, okay, maybe the queries are still slow until the changes percolate all the way to the bottom, but the benefit outweighs the need, um, you know, the cost of having to wait. But there is no downtime to the business at all. So many people, as long as we give them the agility, they're okay um, with not getting the full of the other two uh, values. And as I showed with Shlomi, um, and he's not the only one um, quoting about compression or blotting or compression, as long as we're okay with the other two, and they get the compression that's good enough for them to use TokoDB. One of the things also by grouping that we also get by grouping um, up I.O. operations is we don't get fragmentation onto our indexes and our files. That eliminates a number of um, administration requirements. You know, every now and then you have to run an optimized table on InnoDB just to get the not only to shrink if you're using InnoDB file per table, but also to get more efficient and group all the pages to the beginning or to one part of the file so it, it'll go faster. Again, since we're grouping all the operations, we get less fragmentation than um, InnoDB gets. So what are the things that we have been including on 7.0? Um, uh, we supported... Uh, Index condition pushdown, this is something that MariaDB has. In MySQL doesn't have until 5.6, um, but uh, it improved performance significantly. So not having it, basically, we were executing slow because we needed to get all the data set from the index and then yeah, do the range selects instead of just resolving the range select into the storage engine and retrieving a much smaller data set. Uh, we also support direct I.O. Uh, by default, we use buffered I.O. The reasoning behind that is that uh, because buffered I.O., uh, everything that sits on the OS cache is highly compressed, uh, you would have a lot more data standing in memory than you would have otherwise. And although you have to go through the uh, compression and compression overhead, 
while retrieving the data from the OS cache, at least you don't have the I.O. bottleneck. Um, some data loads actually do not really benefit from that. So users have demonstrated to us as their data volume grows enough that direct I.O. is a better strategy. So we provide it for it. Uh, we also included a lot uh, of the engine status information into the information schema and we're coming up with new instrumentation features. Uh, what this allows you to do is use anything that you're using to monitor MySQL today to also use it to monitor TokuDB as well. Um, we haven't been able yet, we haven't had the time to create the patches to the Cacti monitoring or Monyog or some of the other monitoring tools. Um, to, to include them there, but we're working on it. Um, back in the Percona uh, event in April, we announced being open source. We have all those resources. We answer questions, uh, many times our MySQL specific questions um, that people, because they use our software, they think that they're talking to be specific issues, but, um, and we do our best on open source to be responsive and to help you find the solutions, but it's not tech support, so. As I said, in-memory load improvements, um, one of them is read-only transactions. Read-only, read transactions, um, you know, all the transactions are being queued um, on the system and then satisfied by multiple threads. And, but if it is a read-only transaction, what's the point? You know, it's like you're sitting on the DMV and you have multiple people, clerks, um, dealing with the people that are waiting in line, but you have a question. And the idea is you'll be able to walk to the front of the line, ask the question, get it answered, and get out of there. So you would do it at the DMV, why not do it on the database? And that's exactly what we did. If for whatever reason the data that you're querying for has been changed, it will comply with the MVCC or the multi-versioning uh, concurrency control rules, and it will send you back to the line. Uh, but in the loads where that data hasn't changed and you're constantly querying it, you don't have to wait for anything else to happen in the database. You get a shortcut and we get uh, higher read uh, rates with that. Uh, granular F-Sync control, we had a similar variable than the one that controls the TRX commit on InnoDB. Um, I, we're going to cover that in uh, the getting started in a moment. But we allow, instead of um, having fixed intervals at one second or whatever it's the interval at InnoDB, we allow to actually adjust those intervals for the commits uh, into millisecond ranges. Um, so you can have a more, you have more granularity to control when the F-Syncs to the transaction logs happen. Fast upserts and updates we already covered. What do you do um, if you want to evaluate or get it started, see if it fits your workload? Um, the first is we install from Tarball. We don't have packages yet, and there's a number of reasons for that. If you grab the instructions uh, from the MySQL documentation on how to install from a Tarball, 80 or 90% of that apply to us. There's one that you have to change the default storage engine if you're doing an upgrade from an existing installation. And the reason for that is because we have to update the MySQL system uh, schema before being able to uh, boot, um, uh, before being able to boot with a default TokoDB engine. And so you have to uh, specify the default storage engine to be other than TokoDB to be able to run it for the first time. You have to turn off transparent huge, huge pages in Red Hat 6, Red Hat 6, CentOS 6, Scientific Linux, and all its derivatives. Um, the reason is uh, jmalloc is the memory allocator that we work with, and we decided to work with that because it works better for the 4 megabyte block sizes and the memory structures that we use. And <clears throat> transparent huge pages doesn't, uh, tends not to report the right amount of allocated memory back to jmalloc, and jmalloc is confused and it over allocates memory. Uh, we're very aggressive and very defensive on our strategy, on the coding strategy, so if you have a memory over allocation, it will assert and basically shut down the server, which is something you don't want to happen. 
So on the newer versions, we even verify that if that is enabled, um, it will not start. Uh, so and the error message actually points to the command um, that I listed there, which is how you disable the transparent page pages. Uh, another common mistake when you're getting started, especially when you upgrade, is uh, not realizing that the TokoDB cache size is going to be 50% of available of physical memory. If you have configured InnoDB buffer pool to be 80% of memory, which is you know usual practice, you end up with 120% of memory uh, being reserved. Neither of those caches actually use the memory right away, but as you load the system, and especially in a mixed environment with InnoDB, and uh, TokoDB, you may end up allocating more than 100% of memory, again, assertion um, or the um, out of memory uh, kernel panic triggers and crashes the server and unless you cross check what's going on between the server and the uh, system or kernel messages, you don't really realize what's going on. Um, enable direct I.O. In the case that you decide to go with direct I.O., and again, when you have the bigger data sets, uh, it might be the advisable thing to do. Um, remember that TokoDB cache size has to be, um, in that case, use the same rules you use for InnoDB buffer pool and allocate 80% instead of the 50% that is the default. Number of open files is another common uh, culprit. You know, running tests, it's, it's, it's okay. All the defaults on MySQL are okay for most uh, tests. But when you start going into the real world, uh, it turns out that you have schemas with hundreds of tables, uh, maybe a few partitions, and things start to get nasty. The number of files that TokoDB uses is um, it uses one per key plus one metadata. So for every table, there is at least two files. Um, on top of that, you have to multiply those number of files. If you have secondary keys, of course, that number increases. The T stands for tables, so that multiplies by the number of tables. And you can see how a few hundred tables can end up with enough secondary keys into almost a thousand files, um, depending on the number of tables, of course. And then you have to multiply that by the number of partitions. All of a sudden, the table open cache default of a few hundred files open becomes very inadequate. Uh, so make sure that table open cache is big enough, and being into the thousands, there's no damage to, there's no, um, no pro it causes no problems for 99% uh, of MySQL installations. And you might need to add also the open files limit because that creates a limit into the kernel on how many files the MySQL D process can be open. Um, one of the recommendations from Facebook guys is people open cache having it at 32,000 is not, you know, it's not bad. An open files limit to unlimited for the MySQL process is not bad either. Then you have the F-Sync uh, settings. This is one of the things that people overlook. They relax it for InnoDB, they start evaluating TokoDB, and they find out that it's not faster than, than, um, than InnoDB. And although it looks like a use case where it should be, um, usually they leave the aggressive syncing settings on for TokoDB and not for MySQL. So documentation details how these are set up, both the MySQL <coughs> and the TokoDB, so make them match, and then you can start with the TokoDB F-Sync lock period, which is set in milliseconds on how often to do those uh, flushes to disk. Uh, we do not support foreign keys, nor relational constraints, so if you're gonna uh, convert any tables, make sure to remove those before doing any conversions. Uh, it supports the outer table, table name engine equals TokoDB syntax, um, it's going to lock the original table, the InnoDB table. Uh, it's not going to lock the destination table, the TokoDB table. Uh, and it uses the same uh, code as the optimized loader. So basically what we did is all the code that was put in place to create the new table, it was exposed uh, to, to run as the optimized loader. Um, I recommend uh, reading documentation. Uh, the documentation 
Uh, we have the user's guide, a very technical user's guide, but it's worth uh, going through it, and the getting started guide that covers most of this. We need to add um, a few things uh, there. So we do have an enterprise edition. Uh, uh, the regular uh, hot backup, um, whether it's the MySQL enterprise backup or the extra DB backup solutions, do not apply because they depend on the log um, infrastructure that, or the logs, transaction logs from InnoDB and we work completely different. So they're not aware about TokyoDB. Any other solution works. MySQL dump works. Taking uh, death, um, volume snapshot works. Uh, taking AWS or EBS snapshot works. Um, exactly as you would expect it to work with InnoDB. On top of that, we added an extension to the SQL syntax which is backup to and you specify the destination path. And it works just as you would expect a CP on the operating system with the difference that in this case you don't have to shut down the server. It does exactly the same thing. It grabs everything that is in the data directory, copies it to the destination, and it traps all the I.O. that is going on from the database and keeps updating the destination with that I.O. The mechanisms um, are detailed on our blog article. That article has a second part that was published yesterday or, or, or Thursday, I can't remember, um, and explains why it has to be done that way. It copies files like master info, relay info, all the binary logs if they're sitting on the data directory. So it's very convenient to clone a slave because you stop the slave replication so you don't, since those files are not necessarily transactional, you do a hot backup. As the hot backup finishes, you restart the slave, and as long as you have the proper configuration file, um, you just remount the backup directory into the new server, and you have a slave that will start replicating exactly where that the original slave was replicating from. We also offer technical support as part of the Enterprise Edition. Um, our, our people, and since we have a small team, it's a startup, um, offers office hours, usually between 8 o'clock at uh, Eastern Time. Um, officially, it's from 9 to 6 Eastern Time. Unofficially, it can go from 8 o'clock or you know, earlier, um, whenever someone comes into work, all the way to the end of the day Pacific Time. Um, if you need 24-7 support, we do have partners that offer that and are you know, very well-known names in the MySQL market and community. So you're still covered and that's what many people do is they get 24 seven support from one of our partners and we offer the second tier support. We have an active community. Um, you're gonna find MySQL 5533, which was announced on September 17th, a few days ago. Already includes TokenDB pre-compiled. There are differences in what they implemented and we implemented um, those are summarized there. Basically, there's no hot alter or optimized table operations for the 5.5 tree. Um, they changed the syntax based on some expansions that they did, so it doesn't match even the MySQL syntax. So um, you have to be careful with that um, for your application or backups, especially. And in version 10.0, um, it will include the hot alter table and optimized tables. Um, we have uh, teed up the MySQL 5.6 patches and version um, ourselves. We have been working on it and having nightly builds. We just haven't had the time to go through the QA process. Percona contacted us and they just said, okay, can we work with you? They got all those patches into their system. They worked them out to their Percona versions 5.6 and they have an experimental release. Uh, highlight experimental. Don't expect it to be completely bug free, but um, it goes to show that as long as there is demand, there is going to be a 5.6 release. In the meantime, we have uh, MySQL 5.5 um, supported. This is our list of clients. Um, basically, uh, although we're a startup, we do have an established client base. Um, many of them have been using the product for years. Um, you're going to find interesting University uh, of Montreal is the one where the optimized loader and the high insertion rate was important. Um, 
limelight, um, the query performance and Evidencia, the query performance and frequency.com as well show that actually query performance is where they got most of their uh, bung for the buck. Market U is also an interesting one. So this is our contact information. It's going to be all our live URLs and to the PDF. So you can uh, go from there. Um, Twitter, that's my personal Twitter account. I also, of course, since I do the RSQL podcast, also tweet from that account when a new episode comes out. Um, if you use the community resources, no salesperson is going to contact you. If you use support at talkwithtech.com, it's the only way to get a demo of the Enterprise Edition, including hot backup. But you'll have to deal with a salesperson, which you understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much.